Biography of Famous Politician and Founder of Pakistan Muhammad Ali Jinnah Part 3 Welcome to Mr. Biography YouTube channel. This video is about the biography of famous politician and founder of Pakistan Muhammad Ali Jinnah Part 3. Hope you will enjoy this education-based video and share it with your friends and family members. Leaders of the Congress were more vocal, Jawaharlal Nehru referred to Lahore as Jinnah's fantastic proposals while Chakravarti Raj Lachari deemed Jinnah's views on partition Jinnah's fantastic proposals. The Viceroy promised a representative body after the war to determine India's future, and that no future settlement would be imposed over the objections of a large part of the population. This was satisfactory to neither the Congress nor the League, through Jinnah was pleased that the British had moved towards recognizing Jinnah as the representative of the Muslim community's interests. Jinnah was reluctant to make specific proposals as to the boundaries of Pakistan, or its relationships with Britain and with the rest of the subcontinent, fearing that any precise plan would divide the League. The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor in December 1941 brought the United States into the war. In the following months, the Japanese advanced in Southeast Asia, and the British cabinet sent a mission led by Sir Stafford Cripps to try to conciliate the Indians and cause them to fully back the war. Cripps proposed giving some provinces what was dubbed the local option to remain outside of an Indian central government either for a period of time or permanently, to become dominions on their own or be part of another confederation. The Muslim League was far from certain of winning the legislative votes that would be required for mixed provinces such as Bengal and Punjab to secede, and Jinnah rejected the proposals as not sufficiently recognizing Pakistan's right to exist. The Congress also rejected the Cripps plan, demanding immediate concessions which Cripps was not prepared to give. Despite the rejection, Jinnah and the League saw the Cripps proposal as recognizing Pakistan in principle. The Congress followed the failed Cripps mission by demanding, in August 1942, that the British immediately quit India, proclaiming a mass campaign of Satyagraha until they did. The British promptly arrested most major leaders of the Congress and imprisoned them for the remainder of the war. Gandhi, however, was placed on house arrest in one of the Aga Khan's palaces prior to his release for health reasons in 1944. With the Congress leaders absent from the political scene, Jinnah warned against the threat of Hindu domination and maintained his Pakistan demand without going into great detail about what that would entail. Jinnah also worked to increase the League's political control at the provincial level. He helped to found the newspaper Dawn in the early 1940s in Delhi. It helped to spread the League's massage and eventually became the major English-language newspaper of Pakistan. In September 1944, Mohammad Ali Jinnah hosted Gandhi, recently released from confinement, at his home on Malabar Hill in Bombay. Two weeks of talks between them followed, which resulted in no agreement. Jinnah insisted on Pakistan being conceded prior to the British departure and to come into being immediately, while Gandhi proposed that plebiscites on partition occur sometime after a united India gained its independence. In early 1945, Liaquat and the Congress leader Pula Bhai Desai met, with Jinnar's approval, and agreed that after the war, the Congress and the League should form an interim government with the members of the Executive Council of the Viceroy to be nominated by the Congress and the League in equal numbers. When the Congress leadership were released from prison in June 1945, they repudiated the agreement and censured Desai for acting without proper authority. Field Marshal Viscount Wavell succeeded Lynn Lithgow as Viceroy in 1943. In June 1945, following the release of the Congress leaders, Wavell called for a conference, and invited the leading figures from the various communities to meet with him at Shimla. He proposed a temporary government along the lines which Liaquat Ali Khan and Desai had agreed. However, Wavell was unwilling to guarantee that only the League's candidates would be placed in the seats reserved for Muslims. All other invited groups submitted lists of candidates to the Viceroy. Wavell cut the conference short in mid-July without further seeking an agreement, with a British general election imminent, Churchill's government did not feel it could proceed. British voters returned Clement Attlee and his Labour Party to government later in July. 
Attlee and his Secretary of State for India, Lord Frederick Bethick Lawrence, immediately ordered a review of the Indian situation. Jinnah had no comment on the change of government, but called a meeting of his working committee and issued a statement calling for new elections in India. The League held influence at the provincial level in the Muslim-majority states mostly by alliance, and Jinnah believed that, given the opportunity, the League would improve its electoral standing and lend added support to his claim to be the sole spokesman for the Muslims. We will return to the India in September after consultation with his new masters in London, elections, both for the centre and for the provinces, were announced soon after. The British indicated that formation of a constitution-making body would follow the votes. The Muslim League declared that they would campaign on a single issue, Pakistan. Speaking in Ahmedabad, Jinnah echoed this, Pakistan is a matter of life or death for us. In the December 1945 elections for the Constituent Assembly of India, the League won every seat reserved for Muslims. In the provincial elections in January 1946, the League took 75% of the Muslim vote, an increase from 4.4% in 1937. According to his biographer Balitho this was Jinnar's glorious hour, his arduous political campaigns, his robust beliefs and claims, were at last justified. Volpert wrote that the League's election showing appeared to prove the universal appeal of Pakistan among Muslims of the subcontinent. The Congress dominated the Central Assembly nevertheless, though it lost four seats from its previous strength. In February 1946, the British cabinet resolved to send a delegation to India to negotiate with leaders there. This cabinet mission included Cripps and Pethick Lawrence. The highest level delegation to try to break the deadlock, it arrived in New Delhi in late March. Little negotiation had been done since the previous October because of the elections in India. The British in May released a plan for a united Indian state comprising substantially autonomous provinces, and called for groups of provinces formed on the basis of religion. Matters such as defence, external relations, and communications would be handled by a central authority. Provinces would have the option of leaving the Union entirely, and there would be an interim government with representation from the Congress and the League. Jinnah and his working committee accepted this plan in June, but it fell apart over the question of how many members of the interim government the Congress and the League would have, and over the Congress's desire to include a Muslim member in its representation. Before leaving India, the British ministers stated that they intended to inaugurate an interim government even if one of the major groups was unwilling to participate. The Congress soon joined the new Indian ministry. The League was slower to do so not entering until October 1946. In agreeing to have the League join the government, Muhammad Ali Jinnah abandoned his demands for parity with the Congress and a veto on matters concerning Muslims. The new ministry met amid a backdrop of rioting, especially in Calcutta. The Congress wanted the Viceroy to immediately summon the Constituent Assembly and begin the work of writing a constitution and felt that the League ministers should either join in the request or resign from the government. We will attempted to save the situation by flying leaders such as Jinnar, Liaquat, and Jawaharlal Nehru to London in December 1946. At the end of the talks, participants issued a statement that the constitution would not be forced on any unwilling parts of India. On the way back from London, Jinnah and Liaquat stopped in Cairo for several days of pan-Islamic meetings. The Congress endorsed the joint statement from the London Conference over the angry dissent of some elements. The League refused to do so, and took no part in the constitutional discussions. Muhammad Ali Jinnah had been willing to consider some continued links to Hindustan, as the Hindu majority state which would be formed on partition was sometimes referred to, such as a joint military or communications. However, by December 1946, he insisted on a fully sovereign Pakistan with dominion status. Following the failure of the London trip, Jinnah was in no hurry to reach an agreement, considering that time would allow him to gain the undivided provinces of Bengal and Punjab for Pakistan, but these wealthy, populous provinces had sizable non-Muslim minorities, complicating a settlement. The Atlee ministry desired a rapid British departure from the subcontinent, but had little confidence in Wavell to achieve that end. Beginning in December 1946, 
British officials began looking for a viceregal successor to Wavell, and soon fixed on Admiral Lord Mountbatten of Burma, a war leader popular among conservatives as the great-grandson of Queen Victoria and among Labour for his political views. On 20 February 1947, Attlee announced Mountbatten's appointment, and that Britain would transfer power in India not later than June 1948. Mountbatten took office as Viceroy on 24 March 1947, two days after his arrival in India. By then, the Congress had come around to the idea of partition. Nehru stated in 1960 the truth is that we were tired men and we were getting on in years. The plan for partition offered a way out and we took it. However, the Congress insisted that if Pakistan were to become independent, Bengal and Punjab would have to be divided. Mountbatten had been warned in his briefing papers that Jinnah would be his toughest customer who had proved a chronic nuisance because no one in this country, India, had so far gotten into Jinnah's mind. The men met over six days beginning on April 5. The sessions began lightly when Jinnah, photographed between Louis and Edwin Mountbatten, whipped a rose between two thorns which the viceroy took, perhaps gratuitously, as evidence that the Muslim leader had pre-planned his joke but had expected the viceroy to stand in the middle. Mountbatten was not favorably impressed with Jinnah, repeatedly expressing frustration to his staff about Jinnah's insistence on Pakistan in the face of all argument. Jinnah feared that at the end of the British presence in the subcontinent, they would turn control over to the Congress-dominated Constituent Assembly, putting Muslims at a disadvantage in attempting to win autonomy. He demanded that Mountbatten divide the army prior to independence, which would take at least a year. Mountbatten had hoped that the post-independence arrangements would include a common defense force, but Jinnah saw it as essential that a sovereign state should have its own forces. Mountbatten met with Liak at the day of his final session with Jinnah, and concluded, as he told Atli and the cabinet in May, that it had become clear that the Muslim League would resort to arms if Pakistan in some form were not conceded. The Viceroy was also influenced by negative Muslim reaction to the constitutional report of the Assembly, which envisioned broad powers for the post-independence central government. On 2 June, the final plan was given by the Viceroy to Indian leaders. On 15 August, the British would turn over power to two dominions. The provinces would vote on whether to continue in the existing Constituent Assembly or to have a new one, that is, to join Pakistan. Bengal and Punjab would also vote, both on the question of which assembly to join, and on the partition. A boundary commission would determine the final lines in the partition provinces. Plebiscites would take place in the northwest frontier province, which did not have a league government despite an overwhelmingly Muslim population, and in the majority Muslim Silhat district of Assam, adjacent to eastern Bengal. On 3 June, Mountbatten, Nehru, Jinnah, and Sikh leader Buldev Singh made the formal announcement by radio. Jinnah concluded his address with Pakistan's Zindarabad, Long Live Pakistan, which was not in the script. 165, in the weeks which followed Punjab and Bengal cast the votes which resulted in partition. Silhot and the NWFP voted to cast their lots with Pakistan, a decision joined by the assemblies in Sindh and Baluchistan. On the 4th of July 1947, Liaquit asked Mountbatten on Jinnah's behalf to recommend to the British King, George VI, that Jinnah be appointed Pakistan's first Governor-General. This request angered Mountbatten, who had hoped to have that position in both dominions, he would be India's first post-independence Governor-General, but Jinnah felt that Mountbatten would be likely to favor the new Hindu majority state because of his closeness to Nehru. In addition, the Governor-General would initially be a powerful figure, and Jinnah did not trust anyone else to take that office. Although the Boundary Commission, led by British lawyer Sir Cyril Radcliffe, had not yet reported, there were already massive movements of populations between the nations to be, as well as sectarian violence. Jinnah arranged to sell his house in Bombay and procured a new one in Karachi. On 7 August, Jinnah, with his sister and close staff, 
flew from Delhi to Karachi in Mount Batten's plane, and as the plane taxied, he was heard to murmur, that's the end of that. On the 11th of August, he presided over the new constituent assembly for Pakistan at Karachi, and addressed them, you are free, you are free to go to your temples, you are free to go to your mosques or to any other place of worship in the state of Pakistan, you may belong to any religion or caste or creed. That has nothing to do with the business of the state. I think we should keep that in front of us as our ideal and you will find that in course of time Hindus would cease to be Hindus and Muslims would cease to be Muslims, not in the religious sense, because that is the personal faith of each individual, but in the political sense as citizens of the state. On August 14th, Pakistan became independent Jinnah led the celebrations in Karachi. One observer wrote, here indeed is Pakistan's King Emperor, Archbishop of Canterbury, Speaker, and Prime Minister concentrated into one formidable Quaidi Azam. The Radcliffe Commission, dividing Bengal and Punjab, completed its work and reported to Mountbatten on the 12th of August. The last Viceroy held the maps until the 17th, not wanting to spoil the independence celebrations in both nations. There had already been ethnically charged violence and movement of populations, publication of the Radcliffe line dividing the new nation sparked mass migration, murder, and ethnic cleansing. Many on the wrong side of the lines fled or were murdered, or murdered others, hoping to make facts on the ground which would reverse the commission's verdict. Radcliffe wrote in his report that he knew that neither side would be happy with this award, he declined his fee for the work. Christopher Beaumont, Radcliffe's private secretary, later wrote that Mountbatten must take the blame, though not the sole blame, for the massacres in the Punjab in which between 5 lakhs to a million men, women, and children perished. Thanks a lot for watching our professional biography videos on Mr. Biography YouTube channel. Part 4 will be soon after published Part 3 on Mr. Biography YouTube channel. You can help us to promote our Mr. Biography YouTube channel by like share and subscribe Mr. Biography YouTube channel. Thanks for watching full video about biography of famous politician and founder of Pakistan Muhammad Ali Jinnah Part 3.